In this class, we're going to look at different types of business organization. And we're going to look at the sources of revenue that's available to um, these types of business and also to look at the issues that um, are considerations that confront these types of organization. Now, in the class, we'll look at um, sole traders and we'll also look at partnerships, which is uh, uh, slightly bigger than the sole trader, more people involved. Uh, limited, private limited companies, um, much more legalistic and much more formal. And public limited companies, the PLCs, these are the, the really big companies uh, that we're familiar with that operate across uh, different national boundaries and operate on a large scale within countries. Uh, we'll also look at the end, by the way, at uh, non-profit making organisations. We'll uh, tag that on at the end just to see what, what they're like. So we'll start with the sole trader. Sole trader, single trader within the local community, small scale business, uh, nothing very um, sophisticated about this. Uh, normally one person, perhaps a family, that would constitute a sole trader. Um, and as I said, working within the local community, small scale. So the possible sources of finance for the sole trader are very limited. For example, the owner's savings. Well, that's the most basic one, the most obvious. Could go to the banks, but the banks would need collateral or uh, loan guarantees. And collateral is uh, this idea, it, it's, it's an asset that's promised to the bank to secure a loan. So collateral may uh, be a problem for sole traders. They may not have a house or a piece of land to guarantee the loan or some assets to guarantee the loan. So that could be a problem for the sole trader. Uh, suppliers may help the sole trader. It could be that the suppliers um, of raw materials or of machinery will help the sole trader to get established um, so that they themselves can sell more. They can sell more raw materials uh, to, the, to the sole trader who will manufacture the, the raw materials into something that's sold ultimately to the consumer. Could also be the case, of course, the sole trader will qualify for a government grant or perhaps uh, a preferential loan from the, from the government. If the government wants to see people setting up businesses in a certain area, it might use taxpayers' money to give grants to those people to get the area going and get it trading and get it developed. The key issues facing the sole trader, well, um, security for those lending the funds. Uh, the banks are reluctant to lend to, lend to sole traders if they don't have security. So that's a key consideration. But also the, the banks might put um, conditions on loans or the government might put conditions on its grant and there's an element of loss of control by the owner who may feel that this is um, interference and is destroying the, the business or the business idea that he or she had. You also need to, or the sole trader would need to show evidence that the business has potential to develop. Uh, investors are reluctant to invest in a, in a business if they see it at as something which has got no potential. It's, it's supplying the local area. It's not going to grow. It's, it's not really that interesting to investors. So they want to see some evidence that it can grow. And they want to see the financial history of the, the owner and the business. They want to see some documented evidence. They want to see statements from banks or testimonials from customers or that sort of thing. The next sort of business we'll look at is partnerships. This is um, slightly more sophisticated. There are more people involved and they get together and try to uh, 
set up a business. There are issues that make this a, a problem. It's not all plain sailing, but uh, it's, it's bigger than the sole trader. So the possible sources of finance here, in fact, these are very similar to the sole trader. Uh, their savings, for example, very similar. The banks and the suppliers, like we mentioned earlier. And the, might, the banks might be more willing to lend to the partnership because there are more of them, but it's still an issue. Um, government grants, again, the government might want to encourage the partnership to set up a business in an area where there's high unemployment. So there may be, there may be an issue there. Um, higher purchase agreements. Uh, and leasing companies, they may be prepared to lend to the partnership more effectively than to, uh, or more willingly than to um, a sole trader, because it's uh, it's a bigger organisation, more status, more reputation. The key considerations, well, Getting a new partner in is a problem. Uh, it's not just a question to find someone with money to invest. It's, uh, it's finding a partner who shares the aspirations and the, the mission of the, the partnership. Somebody who will come in and work with the partnership. Not someone who's going to come in, invest and cause trouble and arguments. And you don't want that sort of behavior. So we don't want the energy of the partnership dissipated in a way that's away from its main goal, the goal of satisfying a particular demand in a particular market. Of course, the partnership may have no collateral. It may have uh, no land or buildings or assets to, to pledge to raise the, the loans, perhaps, that it needs to uh, ensure it's got adequate liquidity, adequate money to pay the bills, pay salaries, pay wages, pay... Uh, for raw materials and so on. And there is an expense in raising money. If, if, if the partnership has to go to the market to try and raise money, it may need the services of experts. And the experts don't come cheap. And of course, finally, it must be always in the partner's mind, should they have formed the limited company at the start and forget the partnership idea, just go straight for the limited company. So there must always be a nagging doubt as to whether they've made the right decision. Now let's uh, let's turn to the private limited company and look at the issues here. Well, look at the sources of finance here, I should say. Well, first of all, it depends on the size of the private limited company. Um, depends on how how big it is. So the the possible sources of finance will be dependent upon the size of the business. Suppliers may be willing to to lend to a, a private limited company quicker than a partnership because uh, it's bigger, it's more reputation, it's governed by legal regulation uh, more effectively than the partnership. So the suppliers may have more confidence in it, so they may be prepared to lend more readily to it. That also applies to the banks. They may also be prepared to to lend to it. And indeed, the, the private limited company may be able to raise finance from different sources by uh, pledging uh, assets and pledging different, um, di different, different uh, aspects of the business against a given profit levels, for example, uh, different aspects of the business against the loan. So it's, it's factoring out. It's uh, uh, its requirements for 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 cash. Um, five, its leasing and higher purchase companies might be prepared to look at private limited companies, as opposed to uh, say partnerships and sole traders. Leasing and higher purchase companies are particularly keen to deal with corporate clients. Of course, government grants and loans, similar to the previous two. Uh, venture capitalists, these are specialist investors, will be prepared to look at private limited companies also. These are prepared to put money up front at the start in return for a share in the business and perhaps when the business is established to then sell on their share, make a profit and that's how they exist. 
and the private limited company ultimately has the right to issue shares depending on its documentation and what the documentation says about the amount of shares it's allowed to have and allowed to issue but the private uh, private share issue is a possibility. Now the private limited company, the uh, key consideration here is um, there might be disagreement between the shareholders over the, the goals or the objectives of the business and that may distract the business from the, the core activity, the activity of producing something and selling it in the market. They may spend more time fighting amongst themselves. Uh, it may be difficult to find suitable shareholders. Um, it's not just a question of finding shareholders, but it's finding the right ones, ones who will share the aspirations of the business and share the ideals and, and contribute to the business. Of course, as new shareholders come in, the existing shareholders will be losing some control and they may resist that or may not like it. So that's an issue. And there might be a lack of collateral and security for those lending the funds, the banks, for example. So private limited companies, because they're private limited companies, doesn't mean that they've got assets that are available to secure loans. Just uh, an issue that the banks might want to, uh, to consider before it makes a loan. And the banks, in making that decision, of course, will look at the element of risk in the loan. What banks really want to do is to get rid of the risk if they can. After all, the banks are not lending the bank's money, they're lending the depositor's money. So they want it back because the depositor, perhaps you and I, we want our money back from the bank eventually to do something else with it. So uh, collateral and security for loans is an issue. Now the public limited company, by contrast, is the really big organization. This is the one that may be acting uh, as a large player in the domestic market or could even be in the global market. Um, the sources of finance here are immense. Big opportunities here because the companies are big, they're reputable, they're well known, they're established. Um, so suppliers are very keen to deal with them. To have a, a public limited company as a client is, is something big. So the suppliers might be prepared to lend their services to the company for long periods without payment because they're establishing themselves with a large company, it's long term contracts, it's, it's cash flowing in, but they don't want to alienate the public limited company. And indeed, the public limited company won't, if it's reputable, won't abuse that as well. The banks also would want to uh, lend to the public limited company. Banks like big companies. There's a lot of cash flowing through the account to pay for raw materials, wages, salaries, pay expenses and so on. And on the other side, there's a lot of revenue coming in. So the banks see a lot of activity in the accounts, perhaps millions and millions of um, of resources going through the account and the the public limited company is able to raise cash quite easily on assets indeed it's able to raise, raise uh, uh, cash on its own reputation often by issuing bonds but um, it's it finds it easier to raise cash in the marketplace also, leasing and hire purchase companies would be very pleased to deal with PLCs. A leasing company, perhaps leasing cars, would be very pleased to deal with a public limited company because it would be a big contract. So they may be more flexible in terms of their repayments. Instead of having a, a month, they could say, well, pay us within three months. Well, that's a source of credit. Government grants and loans. The government might be keen on a public company being able to set up in a deprived area, an area of economic deprivation, create jobs, create employment. Venture capitalists are very, very keen to be involved. But generally speaking, they don't have too much of a role in the public limited company because the PLCs don't need venture capitalists so much. 
And finally, of course, the PLC is able to raise cash uh, via the stock exchange. Well, it depends on the uh, documentation, the legal documentation associated with the establishment of the business, but it may be able to go to the stock exchange and ask to raise some more cash, um, whereas private companies can't, partnerships can't, and certainly the sole trader can't do that. The issues for consideration, well, they're very keen on the state of the economy because if they're selling in the, the whole country and the country's going through a recession, let's say, people are not buying the product, its sales are going to be affected. So they're obviously interested in the state of the economy. They're also interested in the stock market. If the stock market dips, then the public limited company is valued less. If it's valued less, it might be taken over by a foreign company. So it needs to keep its value up to stop it from being taken over by uh, by someone else. It also needs to have some flexibility to be able to move subsidiaries, for example, to areas where it can benefit from government aid if government aid was made available in a certain area. So it needs to have some sort of flexibility. It needs to have a good financial performance and it needs to be able to demonstrate that through reputable accounts and people can look up its history, look up its background and um, nothing nothing to hide. It's, it's, uh, these are published openly and people can see them and its, its reputation is enhanced by a good financial performance. The, ultimately the reputation of the company and that of the senior managers determine its position in the market. If the reputation of the company is solid, good, long-standing, running for many years and the senior managers are seen as honest and decent and reputable people, it's a good company and it will have an easy source of, of revenue because people will want to invest in it because it has a good reputation. Now let's, um, as I said earlier, let's just have a quick look at the non-profit making organisations. Um, these are non-commercial, non so we'll just tag it on to the end and just have a quick look at the sources of finance for these. Well, the most obvious one is the charitable donations. If we see a non-profit making organisation, it tends to be charitable, it tends to be doing good work in the community, helping people, and we, we donate to it. We donate um, cash to it to help it out and it survives out of those donations. It could also benefit from lottery money in some countries. Um, the state might run a lottery every week, raise some money and give some to, to the charity. That's, that's quite common in, in many countries. And of course it could uh, be helped out by the government. The government might use taxpayers' money to help the charity because the government thinks that that's a way of helping local communities and the charity is involved with the local community so it's a good way of getting public money into the community. The issues for a non-profit making organisation, well there's only really a couple of these, um, the public profile of the organisation if it's seen as a good cause, it'll raise the money. If it's operated professionally and, again, has a good reputation and it doesn't waste a lot of money in trying to raise money, if it, the money given to the charity goes to the good cause, then that enhances its reputation and its public profile. Finally, um, the non-profit making organisation must have a good relationship with the government because government grants are important and the government in its pronouncements can really make or break a non-profit making organisation. So it's important for the organisation to have a good relationship with the government. Um, that concludes the, uh, the class on the different types of business organisation and uh, the, the non-profit making uh, organisation at the end. So uh, thank you for watching.